and it is shown to be impractical as it will be. So that is the second set of points that basically whatever idealism you have, whatever objectives you have, have to be correlated to your own strengths, to your own capacities. You cannot have a policy that is not correlated to that because that leads to defeat and to disillusionment. And therefore you must correlate your policies, your strategies to your strengths, to your capabilities. Now, I want to go back to 1947. And, you know, we look at as though it's a new country. I mean, it's a new flag, certainly. It's a national anthem. So many things changed in 1947. There's no question about it. And we did become independent. But unfortunately, many things did not change. And one of the things that did not change was the colonial system of administration. There was a collector then, there's a collector now. The British colonial system of administration was based on the belief that, as the ICS put it, it was a heaven-born service, that a, a British officer could do any kind of job anywhere. He could, because he was, by, by virtue of being British, he was superior to any of the natives. He could do anything. He could, uh, he could master a job very quickly. He could master an assignment very quickly. He could run uh, any department at will you know, step by step by step. Now, even in the, in the days of the British Raj, when things were less complicated, that is not possible. And today, in a very, very complex and complicated knowledge economy world, that is absolutely absurd. But today, the reality is, our administrative system is still the colonial system in which administrators are presumed to be people who can do anything. Tomorrow, you can come from agriculture to fisheries, to tourism and then to defense. You can stay three or four years in defense and then move on to sports or shipping. Now, I mean, you know, defense is a complex field. Agriculture is a complex field. Fisheries is a complex field. And as you can see from our very low output of Olympic medals, sports is also a complex field. You cannot really master a situation if you just come in as a bird of passage. Which is why in the Finance Ministry or the Ministry of External Affairs, we have a dedicated cadre of officers who concentrate on foreign policy and who concentrate on financial policy. Because it is recognized that financial policy is very, very crucial, that uh, foreign policy is very, very crucial, and it needs expertise. So you have a cadre of officers. If you are an IFS officer, very rarely I will shift to any other ministry. And people from other ministries are very seldom going to join the IFS. People from other ministries are very seldom going to work in the finance ministry. Now, defense and home are equally important to a country. The home ministry is crucial to internal security. The defense ministry is crucial to external security. Of course, putting these are two separate things. In a sense, there's a lot, there needs to be a lot of coordination working together because they are such many. But in both the home and defense ministries, we see a situation in which you have generalist people in charge. There is no professional input, there is no expert input, and the same theory of the British, that is, we are British, we can do a great job. Today the theory is, we come from administrative service, or we come from some other service, so we can do a great job. I can learn defense in three days, I can learn sports in three hours. Unfortunately, you cannot. It, I mean, even a genius cannot. And most of the people who are in administrative service, most of the people who are in university service, they are not geniuses by a long chalk. So this is a severe handicap that we are facing in this country in that we have removed the colonial people, but we have retained large elements of their colonial administration, the colonial judiciary, and the colonial attitude to policy, and the colonial attitude to people or whatever. You know I mean, you can, I'm not going to elaborate on this, but you can see the disconnect between the people and the administration which is going on now. The same disconnect was there in the colonial past and we are continuing that in the present. And the reality is the present demands an entirely different set of administrative reflexes, responses and skills than what we have now. Why I'm saying this is that foreign policy, as I told you, depends on the strength of a country. And the strength of a country crucially depends on the quality of the administration of the country. And in this context, in 1949, when China was set up as the People's Republic of China, 
it will be hard for us to believe that our economy at that point in time, even after 300 years of British rule, which completely destroyed us, in 1820, we had 24% of global output. By 1947, we had less than 2% of global output. So colonial system destroyed us. But even then, we were double the economy of China. Today, in 1999, that is 50 years later, I'm not talking about 2012, it's even more humiliating. But in 1999, China was two and a half times the Indian economy. So a country which in 1949 was half our size, is, was in 1999 two and a half times our size. So that is the extent of our failure in developing ourselves. We are rightfully proud of the fact that we have been growing, and we have been growing in large part because several sectors of the economy have to an extent been free from government control and state control, and they have in a sense we've been freed from that kind of regulation which is there, which is there in the past, and that started from 1992 onwards. But the reality is, as a country, we have progressed far less than most of the countries in Asia. You look at South Korea, South Korea in 1947, they, uh, the per capita income in South Korea was the same as that of India. I am not even going to mention the per capita income of South Korea today. You please check it on your you know, internet websites and you are going to find out the difference between the Indian per capita income and the South Korean per capita income, which incidentally was roughly equal in 1947. You, are, you, know, you, you check it on your own. So why I am saying this is that, unfortunately in India, if you look at textbooks, we look at our books, every book gives a very idealistic picture of the situation. We had a wonderful freedom struggle, entirely peaceful, week, and the British left like gentlemen. We had a wonderful economic policy. Everybody was looked after. We had a, we have a wonderful system. We have wonderful politicians. We have wonderful officials. We have wonderful, every institution is wonderful. I mean, I'm not sure about the academics, but at least barring the academics, everybody else is wonderful. But unfortunately, despite all these wonderful people, the country is still in a mess. So there is some problem between saying everything is wonderful, everybody is wonderful, policies are wonderful, and the actual ground situation, which is very far from being wonderful. So why, as I said, why I am telling you this is that you have always got to look at the impact on policy on the ground situation. And you work out your adjectives, work out your mark lists, work out your scoring cards when you see the actual situation. Because any policy has to be tested on the grounds of practicality and on the grounds of results. You cannot have, it has to be tailored to reality. And without that kind of a, of a check on policy, you cannot judge policy in the abstract. Because as I told you, any worthwhile policy deals with concrete things. It deals with concrete situations. Now, of course, reality also changes. And, and you know, and situations change, uh, realities change, uh, skills change, needs change, and policy has to be has to keep changing. The ideals may not change as much, or they may change a lot in case there's a revolution in the country or something. But certainly, reality changes, and you have to keep adjusting policy to those realities. It's not a question of you know. In other words, there will be two things. One is there has to be a clear accounting. Now, supposing you judge, let us say, a particular scheme. In India, we have a tendency of judging a scheme by the amount of money that is spent on a scheme. When you hear a ministerial statement on, in parliament about a scheme, the minister will tell you, we have spent so many thousands of crores on the scheme. In a, almost any major country in the world, the, the, any scheme is given in terms of the tangible physical assets created. How many megawatts of electricity, how many uh, you know, milliliters of water, how many, I mean, how many percentage increase in the gross national product, it is not mentioned in money terms, because money is only a means to achieve another objective. In our system of accounting, money becomes the objective. So, if you want to solve a problem, double the outlay. If you want to say that you're doing something, you say that I've given you a 40% higher budget. But what comes out of that higher budget, nobody talks about. So you need a clear accounting, and this accounting has to be based on physical reality, physical improvements, physical pluses to the plus side of any equation. The second thing is you need accountability. Along with accounting, you need accountability. If you make, if you, 
you, you have to have clear physical targets and you fail in those targets, you have to be held accountable, you have to pay a price. And regrettably, because of the fact that our, we have continued the colonial system and all our administrators and, by they, and therefore the politicians who run them are all heaven born, they are, they are free from accountability. Whatever mistakes you make, there is no, I mean, I have traced the careers as a journalist of about, about 160 civil servants. I have traced their careers in terms of the many mistakes that they have made as civil servants, with of course political assistance there. Not one of these civil servants has ever paid a price for making those particular mistakes. Sometimes they have fallen foul of a particular minister, sometimes they have fallen, they have had some other problems in the department, but nobody, none of the 160 people whom I analyzed has ever paid any price for any of the mistakes he or she has made, even though some of those mistakes were quite significant mistakes which have created major problems for us as a country. Even then, not a little bit of accountability has not been there. So you need accounting, you need accountability, and when it is not there, obviously you have distortions in policy. Now, I mean, I've given you a slightly, if I may say so, rambling kind of introduction because I want to set the stage for a, for a discussion on foreign policy. I'm not going to come here and give you a, a school book lecture, you know, uh, America, China, this, that, etc. I'm talking about our country, our foreign policy, but and that has to be set within the context of the situation in our country. So I wanted to give you a certain context in which to analyze our foreign policy. Now, I'm going to move on to the next stage, which is basically our foreign policy per se. Now, I would define our foreign policy as having multiple stages. The first stage, which I will call the age of innocence, was about 1947 to 1962. The second stage, I would call the age of confusion, was 1962 to around 1970. 1971 to 1991, I would define as the age of missed opportunities. 1992 to 1998 is a slow tilt towards realism, so to speak. And 1998 onwards, we have increasingly adopted a foreign policy that bases itself on a unipolar world. So these are the age of innocence, the age of confusion, age of missed opportunities, the climb to realism, and finally, the unipolar world. Now, let's talk about the age of innocence, 1947-1960. You know, when I, when I use the word innocence, I use, in a sense, a belief which is not justified by reality in the goodness of other people, in the goodness of other countries, in the magnanimity of other countries. I mean, I'm reminded, for example, of Pritula Chavan, who I think when the, when the invader first came, to, first came to India, he defeated him, and he sent him back laden with gifts, laden with treasure, and with all honor, and the gentleman came back and made sure that Mr. Chavan had a very short lifespan after that. <laughs> so I think Prithviraj Chavan was, I think, the, the I mean, an early Indian innocent. And we have adopted, we, in a, from 1947 onwards, I think Prithviraj Chavan, in a sense, has been our, was our motto in my, many of our foreign policies as, as an analyst, according to me. In Kashmir, for example, we had a ceasefire when one third of the area of Kashmir was still under occupation of the invaders. In, I, I don't know if you're aware that the Sultan of Oman actually offered Gwadar port to us. You must all have heard about Gwadar now, especially because the Chinese are very active there. I, if I, I'm not remember, I don't remember the exact year, I think 51 or 53 or something. At that time, it belonged to the Sultanate of Oman. The Oman Sultan was very friendly to India. He offered it to us and we refused. We said, why are we interested in a port in that faraway place that, you know, that far away come. We don't want to. So we refused. Shortly after that, the United States offered us the United Nations Security Council seat, which belonged at that time to China. They said, we recognize that China is now communist, that having the, the, the regime in Taipei occupy the seat is absurd. You are a huge country. Why don't you take the seat? We refused. We said, it's not our seat. It's China's seat. We are not going to take it. I mean, and we are still now searching for a UNSC seat. And as a UNESCO peace chair, I can tell you, it's not going to be possible to get a UNSC seat 
on the same veto term as the other five members. But so these chaps are not innocent people. None of them is going to surrender their veto, and all of them are going to keep their veto and make sure that any new permanent member comes without a veto. So we lost that chance. Now, nuclear weapons. I am told by a scientist, and I have a few check in the in Nala part, nuclear, uh, nuclear, let's say nuclear deal. You'll find a lot of my writings on, on this subject. I've been in very close contact with our scientists, but I'm happy to say that people like Raja Ramana and others are the distinct uh, fellows in my department and we have regular interaction with them. We could have developed a nuclear weapon, I'm told, around 1963 or, you know, or, 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 or thereabouts. We did not do it, the Chinese did. Because we felt that nuclear weapons somehow evil, that somehow good people don't have nuclear weapons. So Mao Zedong did not worry about being good. He exploded a nuclear weapon in 1964, if I remember, and we did not. Although at that point in time, our nuclear technology was ahead of Chinese technology. Today it's a different situation. We are not ahead of Chinese technology. At that point in time, we were significantly ahead of the Chinese, but a decision was taken not to go into nuclear weapons. Our economic model, now we have Indians are an extremely creative people. They are extremely productive people. You see, across the country, you know, whether it's a farmer in Punjab, whether it's a businessman in Coimbatore, all over the country you find extremely creative and productive people. But we have we adopted a Soviet model, in which the bureaucracy and state-owned enterprises become the norm, and people are, in a sense, their creative powers are not harassed. So, I'm not going to go. This is a very, very, very long list. Of, uh, of policies that were taken in an innocent belief that the state is perfect, the people are 